It's really great to have this choir here with us today, Lars. Thank you all for being here. And to you too. I understand you know this group pretty well, yeah. since they were with you in your last parish, and the director is no stranger to you either. <laughs> it's really wonderful that they could be, make the trip and be part of our service today. And how wonderful they brought that lovely song that we just heard. Now, it's no secret that my Swedish is a little bit weak, <laughs> but I understand the title of that song is Sweden. I didn't catch many of the words, but the music is very pretty. And with a name like that, I would assume then that it's about the beautiful scenery and all the nice things to see and do in Sweden. And I think I heard the word potato in there as well. <laughs> Am I getting that right? That's right. <laughs> Yes, you're so right. This song is, it was sung by one of the most popular rock groups in Sweden, Kent. And it alludes to very typical Swedish phenomena. Midsummer celebration, light nights, the midnight sun, parties with potatoes and herring, all which we like very much and are so proud of in Sweden. But I think there is also some kind of irony in the lyrics. Sometimes we Swedes have for, uh, thought for a long time that we have been living in the best of the worlds, that we are the most modern and enlightened, enlightened people of all peoples on the world. But what happens when our image of ourselves is challenged? Is everyone welcome? to our table? What do we mean with all our big words of room for everyone? This song was written about 15 years ago, but the words are really in question in our time, when our solidarity with people in need is challenged. Millions of refugees risk their lives to get away from war and persecution and wish to find a place of rescue and share our European table. Are we able to, to say, welcome, welcome here? Yeah, and I, I admire that a lot. I think it's not easy to start asking those sorts of questions in a personal way. I mean, we all see the news. We all know we're in the middle of this massive refugee crisis today. People are fleeing violence and persecution and political instability in record numbers. Boats are washing up on the shores of the Mediterranean. We all know the news. But it's hard to get from all those overwhelming stories and statistics to the next step of asking, what does all this have to do with me? I think we can read the Bible sometimes that way too. We can imagine that it's all about distant spiritual stuff, far from what's actually happening in our neighborhoods. Like that reading we heard from the first letter of John a few minutes ago. It has all that nice, memorable, poetic language about love. God is love, and those who abide in love abide in God, and God abides in them. It's cozy, comfortable language, and it can seem like it takes place a few thousand feet up in the heavens, or at least way up in my brain, in some kind of spiritual love fest where God and I hang out and think really nice thoughts about one another. <laughs> but that same passage also says this, just a little bit later. Those who say I love God and hate their brothers and sisters are liars. For those who do not love a brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they've not seen. And that doesn't leave it all up in the clouds anymore. That says that my training for loving God is actually the person who's in front of me this very minute. The person who may be very much like me or who may be very different. This person, the one I'm faced with right now, can help me learn what it means to love God. And that's very different, isn't it? Yes, you are so right. There are so much in media these days on the refugees coming from coming to Italy and Greece. But what strikes me most are the interviews with the volunteers, people from local churches and other NGOs who meet the refugees when they arrive to the ports, giving, giving them food and blankets, inviting them to their churches, offering 
language courses, encouraging them to help newcomers. And this is such a contrast to other voices who come from distance and talk about higher walls, higher fences, stricter laws. Of course, it's necessary to find solutions on a political level, but we must never forget this commandment. Those who love God must love their brothers and sisters also. And I believe there is some kind of a crazy now in the Christian tradition. We need these holy fools who dare to challenge the establishment. I suppose Philip, which we heard about in the second re first reading, that he would have been sent to church authorities for baptizing this Ethiopian eunuch without the prescribed course of preparation. But the situation is right now. Now is time for action. The love of God forces us to act. And this encounter face to face changes us. I was so touched by a testimony I saw on, on the Facebook, a person I know quite well. And she stated that I, I can't anymore pass this Roma beggar which sits there on the way to the shop. So she decided to invite this man for dinner at her home. And they became very close friends. And they started to discuss how can we improve your situation for, and for your family. And this encounter really changed her. Perfect love casts out fear, we read in the letter of John. Yeah, and that's a beautiful story, Lars. And it's a little like what happens in that Acts reading. Those two characters in the story are total strangers. They're from different cultures, different economic situations, likely different faiths. They're from different worlds, but they end up sharing the same stretch of road for a little while. And what I love about that encounter is that you can't actually tell who's hosting who. Yes, the Ethiopian eunuch has questions and Philip has some answers. So you might imagine that Philip would simply be the teacher and the eunuch would be the student. But it's the eunuch who invites Philip into the chariot. He's the one who makes room for Philip. He's the one who gets the conversation going by asking the questions on his mind. And he's the one who asks to be baptized. You get the sense that you're watching this small encounter that is bigger than either of the people involved. You're watching what happens when people are actually open to the spirit of God in others. It's a simple, gracious meeting, and both persons end up changed, I think. There's no telling what boundaries the spirit will break down when we are open like that. Yeah, there is really power in the spirit of love, power to tear down walls that keep us divided. We are soon going to sing a Swedish hymn, Guds kärlek är som stranden och som havet. The love of God is broad like beach and meadow. A hymn that was very much sung in former GDR, Eastern Germany. 25 years ago, the walls were torn down in Eastern Europe. Maybe this hymn was sort of one part of this, that <laughs> destruction of the wall. And people were able to, to meet again. And we lived then, I do remember, we lived then in a state of real euphoria. Things really changed. But we need to sing this song even today to remind ourselves that walls and boundaries can't save us. Our freedom is our freedom, our willingness to recognize our Savior Jesus Christ in the one or the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, as, as he said. And this encounter will change our lives. And then we can say, welcome to each other. Welcome home. Welcome to find yourself in relation to others, in relation to God, our source of life. Amen. Let's sing. Mm -hmm.